This example walks you through step-by-step uh, -step how to conduct hypothesis testing with a one-way analysis of variance. There are a couple of documents that you can use on Moodle to help you with your calculations if you wish. Um, I will be suggesting that you pause and attempt it on your own as you go through this process. This also corresponds to work that we're doing in Chapter 12 in your textbook. So our main research question here is we want to know, does espresso consumption influence video game performance? The study that we are conducting has to do with whether or not students can do well playing Flappy Bird. And many of you probably have seen this if you have an iPad. I know that lots of students on campus are sometimes playing Flappy Bird. So the study is uh, participants are college students. There's 20 of them. Our dependent variable is the number of Flappy Bird levels somebody can complete before they um, die. And the independent variable is espresso consumption. And you'll see that we have no espresso one shot, two shots, or three shots prior to playing the Flappy Bird game. So we begin with our population comparison distribution and assumptions. First, our populations. We have four because we have four different levels of the independent variable. We have populations of Flappy Bird scores for people who didn't ex consume espresso, for people who consumed one shot, two shots, and three shots of espresso. So those are our four groups. Our comparison distribution is an F distribution. So now that we're doing analysis of variance, we're using a different distribution for our test. We have several assumptions as well. The first is random or is distribution <clears throat> is approximately normal. So we're saying that if we have at least 30 participants, we can expect that we would probably approximate normality. And in this case, we actually have uh, n being less than 30. So we can't necessarily make this assumption. The second is that our participants are randomly selected. And remember, this is something that has to do with the generalizability of our findings. And it's pretty rare that random selection gets used. And in this case, we didn't have random selection. Uh, the third is that the dependent variable is scale. So our outcome is the number of levels that somebody completes on Flappy Bird. And so that is a scale variable. And lastly, we have a, a new assumption. So the first three are ones that you've seen before, but this last one is called homoskedasticity. Another way that we can say that is homogeneity of variance. So with homoskedasticity, what we're looking for to see whether or not this assumption is met is we calculate the variance for each of our different groups. That means that we'll have a variance for the no shots of espresso, the one shot, the two shot and the three shots of espresso groups. Then we take the smallest variance and we multiply it by two. And that value, the two times the smallest variance, should be greater than the largest variance from all of the groups. If, if that is the case, then we can assume that we've met the assumption of homoskedasticity, or uh, you could also say of homogeneity of variance. So the second step is to state the null and research hypotheses. And you'll notice that here, when you talk about the null hypothesis, really the only way you can state this is that all of the group means are equal. So espresso consumption does not affect Flappy Bird scores is our null hypothesis. So they're all the same symbolically as well. And for our alternative hypothesis, then we're saying that average Flappy Bird scores are different among the levels of espresso consumption. And again, you can see that we ex express this as non-equivalence. So the mean of no shots is not the same as the mean of one shot. It's not the same as the mean of two shots. It's not the same as the mean of three shots. And essentially what we're saying is there is a difference somewhere. So now we need to find the characteristics of the comparison distribution. And in step one, we determined our comparison distribution is an F distribution because we have more than two means that we'd like to compare. 
So what are the characteristics of our comparison distribution? Well, we need two different pieces of information in order to complete step four um, that tell us which specific F, F distribution we're going to use. The first one is calculated uh, as degrees of freedom between. So it's the number of levels of our independent variable or our number of groups minus one. In this case, we have four groups. So our degrees of freedom between groups is three. And we said in the very beginning that our overall number of participants is 20. And we can use that information if we know how many are in each group to get degrees of freedom within. And in this case, we know that um, there are actually equal numbers in each group. And so we have uh, degrees of freedom for each of the groups is going to be the same. We've got five people in a group. We subtract one and we get four for group one, group two, group three, and group four. And if we sum those together, we get a degrees of freedom within of 16. Next is step four, where we determine the critical values, our cutoffs. Again, to remind you, our null hypothesis is that all of our group means are the same, and our alternative hypothesis, our research hypothesis, is that they're different in some way. We set our p-value at 0.05, that's our type 1 error rate, and remember, we don't have to specify our one- or two-tailed test because we're dealing with the F distribution and there's only a single tail, so the whole 5% ends up in that one tail. So we put it all into one tail of the F distribution, which again, here's kind of a little reminder of that picture. Where is our cutoff here? And if we look here, we have within groups, degrees of freedom, and that happens to be 16 for our sample. And our between groups degrees of freedom is three. So I've highlighted here for P is 0 0.05 for 16 degrees of freedom, the whole row. And for our between groups degrees of freedom of 3, we find that our critical value is 3.24. So we can go ahead and add that to our F distribution. This is our 5%, and we know that this value is 3.24 that cuts off that 5% of the distribution. And we'll come back to this when we make our decision in step 6. So the next step, step 5, this is the labor-intensive part of calculating an analysis of variance. And this is where I would say, if you haven't already, go to the Moodle website that um, we have for this class and download the Word or Excel file, depending upon how you'd like to do it. You can print the Word file and, and work along as um, I go through this process. Under a link titled, One Way ANOVA Excel and MS Word to Use with Hypothesis Testing with ANOVA Example. So here we begin. In this step, what we're going to do is we've got our list of scores, our X's, and then we have each group, and I've shaded the background a little bit differently for each group so that you can um, determine which, goes, um, which scores go with which group. So now I'd like you to take a minute to look at these scores and figure out which kind of sums of squares is each of these sets going to represent if I added these together or this together. Or this together. So go ahead and note those for yourself. Um, you might want to pause for a minute while you figure that out. Okay, so if you said the first set was sums of squares within, you were correct. And if you said the second set was sums of squares between, you were also correct. And finally, the last set is sums of squares total. So we're going to start by working with sums of squares within. And we know the mean of the first set of scores here is 4. So we take each individual score and we subtract out the mean and we square that value. We can do the same thing for the remaining scores, where here we have um, 6.2 as our mean for this set of scores. And we um, subtract 8 minus 6.2 gives us 1.8. You square that value. So you'll see that for each set of, of scores, each group gets its own group mean subtracted from the x's to get the sums of squares within. And here are all of our values. You might want to check your answers. Okay, if we added all of that together, then we would get this final number down here of 82.8. And that we transfer to our source table here, where you see sums of squares within, 
which is where we started, and we'll add that value of 82.8. So now we're going to go back and calculate our sums of squares between. And first we have to talk about this little GM here. What is the grand mean? Well, it's the mean of all of our individual X scores, regardless of the group that they are in. So we use um, the sum of all the x's divided by the total number of participants, and that will give us our average, as opposed to having a group mean of, say, for this first group, 4. So in our case, if we add all of these x scores up, we'll get a sum of 121. We divide by 20 participants, and we get a grand mean of 6.05. Now, this next part is one of the things that people often get confused with. Now, I've put a fill back in all of our means here for our different groups. Um, you'll notice that I have an, a spot for every single individual. Um, even though we only have one mean for each group and, and a grand mean, one grand mean overall, we still need to, for each person, subtract the mean of that group, um, subtract the grand mean from the mean of that particular group. So, to begin with, we'll say, okay, um, it says 4 minus 6.05, because the mean of the first group is 4, the grand mean is 6.05. And we do that for the entire column, and you'll see that we have negative 2.05 repeated five times. Each of those values are then squared, and we get 4.203, and that is what we have in this column that we're going to end up summing. So the thing that really throws people off with the sums of squares between is that you actually have to weight this difference by the number of participants in the group. So for each individual in a particular group, you're going to have a mean minus grand mean score that you sum together to get sums of squares between. You might want to take a, a moment to pause here and see if you can come up with the correct calculations for the rest of sums of squares between. Okay, so you've taken a moment to do um, some calculations, and here's an opportunity then to check your values. Um, notice I actually changed these back so I didn't round those values. Um, but you can go through and check and see if your work agrees. And if I sum all of those um, deviations, squared deviations from the grand mean, I get 40.15. So that is our second sums of squares, and if we put it into our table, we'll put it here for sums of squares between. Now we still need to compute sums of squares total. And in order to do that, we'll take each individual x score and subtract the grand mean. I've moved our grand mean over here so that you can see what we're doing. So here, for example, I'll take that first score, 3, subtract 6.05. And then I do the same thing for the next score, 4, subtract 6.05, and again, and so forth. So you might want to pause here and take a moment to go ahead and compute um, not only the, these deviations from the mean, but also to square all of those values. Okay, so here's all the values that we have. If you sum all of those squared deviations, you get 122.95. And we enter that in the table here as well. If you look at these two top values, you can check your work by adding them together. So 40.15 plus 82.8 actually adds up to 122.95. That is the hardest part, the most labor intensive part, is getting the sums of squares for your analysis of variance table. In the next video, we'll continue filling in the source table as we talk about how to get the degrees of freedom, the mean square, and calculate the F statistic, and not only that, but make a decision about the F statistic.